next lesson I simply call Lifelong Learners. Now, if you're in the world of education, you've heard that term many, many times. Lifelong Learners. Because teachers in school are encouraged, uh, or encourage their students to become lifelong learners. Why? Because people today especially need to continue to learn if they're going to survive in this world. By continuing to learn, they'll be able to be successful, they'll be able to prosper in this world that's changing ever so quickly. Well, for Christians, we also have to be lifelong learners. If we're going to survive, if we're going to be able to exist in this world, if we're going to be able to finish the race, we must be learners. We must continue to study God's Word daily, all of our lives. Paul stresses this when he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, Paul wrote to Timothy, who at this time was a, a located preacher, and Timothy needed to pass this on to the congregation. He says, but you must continue in the things which you've learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you've learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. So being students of the Bible throughout our time here on earth equips us, it enables us to be faithful, he says, all the way to the end. So we can never get to the point where we know everything the Bible says, or we think we do. We must be lifelong learners. And ex a, a great example of this is found in the Old Testament in the life of a priest. And that particular priest <clears throat> was Ezra. I'd like for us to turn as our main text for tonight to the book of Ezra. And we're going to begin in Ezra chapter 7. Ezra chapter 7. <clears throat> I won't go through the list, but in the first five verses of, of Ezra chapter 7, we see that Ezra was a priest who was in the lineage of Aaron. So as the years went by, one of the descendants of Aaron was Ezra the priest. And of course, this is the time when many of the Jews who had been in Babylon in captivity were allowed to come back to Jerusalem, to their homeland. And so Ezra is one of those who has been appointed by God to help God's people come back to the land. He further goes on and says in verse 6, This Ezra came up from Babylon, and he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. Ezra had asked the king of Persia to be allowed to come back to Jerusalem, to the land of God's people. So he was a skilled scribe, which meant he was skilled in the law of Moses. He knew the law of Moses. He knew how to teach the law of Moses. He knew how to instruct people in following the law of Moses. His journey from Babylon, the Bible says, to Jerusalem took four months. And during this four months, Ezra realized that God's hand had been in all of these things. Notice verse 7. Ezra chapter 7, verse 7. Some of the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Nephilim, came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, that's four months later, which was in the seventh year of the king. On the first day of the first month, he began his journey from Babylon. On the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. 
So in going from Babylon to Jerusalem, it was a four-month journey for Ezra. He realizes during that time that God's hand had been upon him, that God was with him, that God prospered him on his journey. Well, then we see the Bible's description of Ezra as a student of God's Word. And this is going to be the focus of tonight's lesson. Verse 10, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. We see four things that are necessary, four attributes, four qualities, four characteristics that's necessary for someone to be a capable Bible student. We are called by God to be Bible students ourselves. We don't go to a priest today and ask what the Bible means. We don't go to a committee and ask what the Bible means. We have a responsibility as God's people to come to know God's will, to come to know His Word. Ezra here tells us in one very short verse how to do that properly. How to be lifelong learners, how to be students of God's Word throughout our lifetime. And notice what it begins with. Ezra prepared his heart. There is step number one. For someone to be a good Bible student, for someone to, to be able to learn God's Word and to understand it, he must prepare his heart. The Bible talks about the need to prepare in so many different circumstances. We are told, called to be people who prepare. Isn't that what our life is about now? We're simply preparing for the next life. This, this world and this life is not what it's about. But this is a time to prepare. This is a time in which we prepare for the next. This is a temporary life. You know, we're just, the Bible calls us pilgrims. The Bible calls us sojourners. This is a time of preparing. Well, to be good Bible students, we have to prepare our hearts. Prepare our hearts to seek the Lord. Prepare our hearts to learn what God's Word says. It's interesting when you look at God's Word to see the various things that the Bible says involves our hearts. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 4, Matthew tells us in his account of the Gospel, this, Matthew chapter 9, verse 4 says, But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts. The Bible says then, and Jesus tells us, that we reason and think in our hearts. We reason and think in our hearts. So part of our hearts involves reasoning and thinking. Those skills are involved in our hearts. So when we prepare our hearts, we're preparing to reason and think. We're preparing to reason and think. There's one of the things we learn. In Romans chapter 10, we learn something else about our hearts. Romans chapter 10, verse 10. Romans 10, 10. <clears throat> For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. So our heart believes. Our heart believes. And then also, and this is maybe something we've passed over and shouldn't have, but notice what Romans 6 verse 17 says about our hearts. Romans 6 17 says this, <clears throat> But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. What did they do? They obeyed from the heart a form of doctrine. So notice what the heart involves. We believe with our heart. 
We reason and we think with our heart and we obey with our heart. So when Ezra says that he prepared his heart to seek the law, to seek God's word, it involved all of those things. Believing, reasoning, thinking, obeying. That's what our heart does. So when we prepare our hearts, when we open up God's Word to be and, and, and to understand what it says, our hearts to be involved in it. We're to reason, we're to think. He wants us to know what His Word says. He wants us to know that. So we have to prepare our hearts for that very thing. Then, what does it say about Ezra? <clears throat> It says he prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. And if you have a footnote, you'll see that the word seek there is sometimes translated study. So he prepared his heart to study God's word, his law. So prepared his heart. Now, once his heart is prepared, he can actually study God's word. Study is work. Study is work. It's hard work. If we really want to understand and know God's Word like we should, it's going to be hard work. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, we see how hard that work is. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. <clears throat> Paul wrote to Timothy, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What's involved? Diligence, effort, work. He says it's a worker. Someone who studies God's word is a worker. Now, what's the outcome supposed to be? So that you rightly divide the word of truth. One of the ideas involved in rightly dividing is plowing a straight line. Plowing a straight line. So that when you come to God's word, you put effort and, and energy and time into knowing what he is trying to say. What is he telling me from this verse, this text, this paragraph? Takes diligence, takes effort, takes time. But that's what he expects of us. Not just once or twice, but throughout our life, we are to be learners. Now, if we're really going to be the type of learners and students God wants us to be, we have to really long for knowing God's Word and desiring it. I'm sure we remember being in school. Some of the subjects that we liked, we put more effort into knowing them, didn't we? It's obvious that's the way we are. That's the way God's people are to be about His Word. This is to be our favorite subject. Our favorite subject. And since it's our favorite subject, we're going to long, and, long for it and desire it more than anything else. A great verse, and I would mark it in your Bibles if you can, is Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16. It's just a great verse dealing with this. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16. <clears throat> give you a minute to get there because uh, it's just such a wonderful verse. Jeremiah says, your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Those who follow God should rejoice at knowing God's word. That's what Jeremiah is saying. Your words made me rejoice. If you have that attitude toward God's Word, you're going to be more diligent in understanding it. You're going to be more diligent in studying it. 
You're going to be more diligent. You're going to put more effort into it. So that's why we must desire it and long for it to be the kind of students and learners God wants us to be. Of course, many don't approach the Bible properly. Some are never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. The Bible talks about a couple of men who were never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7. Never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Many people, not just a couple, but many, many people are in that category. There's many reasons why people cannot come to a knowledge of the truth. There's many reasons. Maybe because they try and use the Bible to prove their beliefs instead of using the Bible to determine their beliefs. There is a vast difference between those two things. Some use the Bible just to try and prove what they already believe. That's not the way we approach the Bible. We study the Bible to determine what we should believe. Not what we've been told or what's been passed down or what some committee or group or organization told us to believe, but what study has revealed to us that we should believe. That's what we're to do. Many don't do that, though. Others, of course, just give up and say the Bible's too difficult. No, it's not. With time and effort, we can determine what the Bible says. Or, of course, the Bible says that some people just twist the Bible. They twist and turn the Bible. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter talks about what can happen in certain occasions or on certain occasions. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 15 and following. 2 Peter 3, 15. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the Scriptures. Are some things more difficult to understand in God's Word than others? Absolutely, it's what he said. Are some things impossible to understand? No. He said they're hard to understand, not impossible. Discernment and understanding is hard work. It is hard work. Yes, some things are, are easier than others, but if we put in the time and effort, we can come to know what it says. The third thing Ezra says that's necessary, <clears throat> after preparing your heart, after studying God's Word, is to practice it. Notice it says, for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to do it. It's not enough to know. We must also do. We must also do. How many of us from the time we were little <clears throat> sang the children's song about the wise man and the foolish man? The foolish man built his house on the sand. And the winds came and the, and the rains came. And what happened? The house was abolished, right? Destroyed. Great was the fall of it. But the wise man built his house upon the rock. Winds came and, and, and the rains came, but that house stood solid. What prompted that story, though? Let's go and read Matthew chapter 7, the very end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 7. And we'll see what prompted it and what lesson it has for us. Matthew 7 <clears throat> verse 24 Matthew 7, 24 Therefore whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them I will liken him to a wise man. So the one who built his house on the rock represented the person who heard the sayings of Jesus and did them didn't just believe them. He heard them, believed them, and did them. 
further on. Verse 26, But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man. So the foolish man was the one who heard the sayings but did not do them. Did not do them. He was the foolish man. So as Ezra says here, we not only must know God's word, we must put it into practice. Put it into practice. Remember what James says? James chapter 1 about the one who looks into the perfect law of liberty. James chapter 1. We'll begin in verse 22, I believe it is. <coughs> James chapter 1, verse 22. <clears throat> But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Now that's the one who looks into the, the law, the word, but doesn't do it. Verse 25. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. A doer of the work. What? This one will be blessed in what he does. James says there is a great distinction between the one who looks into the word and does it and one who looks into the word and doesn't do it. The one who does it and continues doing it is the only one who is blessed. That's what he tells us. <clears throat> and then the last thing about Ezra. So Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. I know you have heard many times that if you really want to learn something... And the best way is have to teach it. Have to teach it. Well, that's what Ezra is telling us here. You want to know God's Word well enough to be able to teach it. Well, that means a lot of work. That means a lot of effort. That means a lot of time. So teaching God's Word... And, of course, the, the avenues for teaching can be in, in so many different ways. Of course, teaching in the home is critical. You know, the Jews, back in Deuteronomy chapter 6, were given the instruction that they were to teach God's Word at all times, when they rose up, uh, when they ate, when they uh, went down, or, you know, at, at all times they were to take opportunities to teach their children. That was their responsibility. So teaching it is essential. Remember what Paul told Timothy? It says, you have known the Holy Scriptures from childhood. And actually the word goes all the way back to babyhood. From the time you were a baby, Paul says, Timothy, you heard the Scriptures. You were taught the Scriptures. Carter now knows that there are two different parts of the Bible. How many parts of the Bible are there, Carter? Two. How many books in the Bible? Two. He hasn't quite got to the 66th part yet. He understands, though, or knows that there are two parts, old and new. We teach from babyhood. Kids are amazing learners. And we're to be teachers of that word. We can teach one-on-one. -on -one. Obviously, and that's probably the very best way, is teaching one-on-one. -on -one. Remember Philip and the, and the Ethiopian? Philip catches up with him. The Ethiopian eunuch was reading, and, and Philip asked him, Do you know what you're reading? How can I unless someone teaches me? So that's what Philip did. Right there and then taught him, taught him about who Jesus was, taught him about baptism because why? As they went along, they saw a big body of water and Eunuch says, what does hinder me from being baptized? And so he was baptized right then and there. Teaching, teaching every day, teaching everywhere 
everywhere you look and, and, and everybody you see, there's an opportunity to teach. There's an opportunity to teach. Whatever it is that needs to be taught, use that as an opportunity. And you can have a great impact on people's lives. In Psalm 51, we have these words left for us that are quite important. Psalm 51, <clears throat> verses 12 and 13. This is considered to be one of David's psalms. Verses 12 and 13 of Psalms 51. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. See, there's the impact says, I will teach sinners, I will teach transgressors, and they will be converted to you. People are converted by the Word. They're converted by teaching. They're converted by learning what God wants of them. That's how they're saved. That's how they're converted. Hearing God's Word. That's what the Holy Spirit uses. Uses God's Word to convert. Ezra has left us a tremendous example about how to be the kind of Bible student God wants us to be. Not just during one time of our lives or one part of our lives, but throughout our lives we are to be learners. Learning more and more about God's Word. We prepare our hearts. We study diligently. <clears throat> We put it into practice and we teach it. A great, great example. It's an example for me and it's an example for you. It's an example for all of us about how important studying God's Word is. And of course, it's God's Word that tells us how one becomes a Christian. The importance of belief, the importance of repentance. The need for that, that great public confession where you, where you confess your belief. And being born again, like Nicodemus asked Jesus, except ye be born of water and the Spirit, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. As Romans chapter 6 tells us, we're buried with him in baptism. And then we're raised to walk in newness of life. It's His Word that reveals that to us. It's His Word that reveals to us that we need to daily confess our wrongs, 1 John 1. Continue to walk in the light, 1 John 1. It's His Word that reveals that to us. And tonight, if there is a need for, for whatever to become a New Testament Christian, to be born again, to ask for prayers, whatever you might need, we encourage you to come as we stand and sing this invitation song. Let's stand, please.